Welcome all. We've got um, Zoom is in the process of letting everyone in, but welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Erin Lurie, and I am the Adult Audiences Manager at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. Fall is always a bustling time at Hillwood. We've got a lot of wonderful upcoming programs. Jessica can show you the upcoming schedule on the next screen. We've got some wonderful upcoming horticulture workshops, and of course, fall gardens are always wonderful at Hillwood. We also will celebrate next month with a um, lecture series on our special exhibition, Natural Beauties, and a couple of other fun things coming up. I would be remiss if I didn't mention something we're used to celebrating in Hillwoods Gardens has gone virtual this year. We've got our Spooky Pooch Halloween costume contest. So if you have four-legged friends who like dressing up, please send your photos or videos in advance and join us for that program where we'll be doing a virtual pooch parade. We are open to the public Tuesday through Sunday and starting this week, we are staying open late on some Friday evenings. So please visit our website. Those of you who are in the DC area, we want to see you around the grounds. And of course, since we are dealing with capacity restrictions and contact tracing and all of that good stuff, we do require reservations in advance to make sure that we're keeping visitation nice and quiet so that there's plenty of space to social distance. Now, with all of my coming attractions done, I wanna share just a few quick Zoom reminders. We absolutely want to hear from you. Jessica loves visitor questions as anybody who's attended one of her in-person workshops knows. So please do not be shy. You can send questions or comments through your chat box. Your cameras and microphones can be either on or off. Right now, we're gonna ask everybody to stay muted, but if you have questions, we can put you up on screen and ask you to unmute so that you can share them in your own voice. I will be addressing folks by the name that's listed in Zoom. So uh, on the next screen, I think we've got a reminder of how to go about renaming yourself if you don't wanna be referred to as iPad 27 or something else fun and enjoyable like that. It's now my pleasure to turn you over to Jessica Bonilla, who is Hillwood's Director of Horticulture. She joined Hillwood 11 years ago and was promoted to the director position this year. She leads our staff and, and um, volunteers for garden upkeep, greenhouses, everything in the gardens falls under her purview with a lot of help from her wonderful team. We are so thrilled to have her, and I'm going to let her start talking about fall herb gardens. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so happy that you've all joined us this afternoon. It's uh, really wonderful. So hi, I'm Jessica, and we are going to talk about herbs today. Specifically, we're going to be talking about um, Hillwood's Herb Garden. So I usually give uh, a program uh, in the spring, like Erin, I think, mentioned. I do workshops uh, with herbs, but really fall is really an important time as well. Uh, you know, this is about the time where you, you're thinking about your last, last harvest and really how to keep all those good flavors over the winter. So in today's talk, um, I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about the garden itself the, and the design, but really we're gonna focus on Hillwood's herbs, harvesting, and then making them your own. So for those who might not be familiar with our garden, um, it is located there in the cutting garden on the east side edge, really by the cafe. And this herb garden has gone through a lot of iterations through the years, and really what we have now is an adaptation really for the last 15 years that's really a collaboration between the horticulture staff and the cafe. So this is 
really what we think about. They, they contact us at the beginning of the spring and they say, hey, you know, we could really use this, this, and this. And, and then we see, well, what we can do to fill in their, fill their requests. Um, most of the time, we really do pretty standard herbs in there, ones that you would find in really any good herb garden, because um, we really want to give them the, the flexibility um, to be creative and, and use herbs that really have, have multi-purposes. So that's uh, really even just this past um, month, they've been serving uh, the rosemary lemonade and uh, which was really a big hit and that rosemary then was from our garden. So the design, I'm gonna just start it. So the design to the garden, hold on one second. I have maybe this is keeping me from starting this video. Okay, anyway. So the garden really is about 40 feet long and it's a semicircle. So, uh, but it's a little flattened out at the top. So it's really only about 15 feet deep. And really the paths run like spokes um, of a wheel. And really what that does is that it keeps um, uh, you walking on a path while you're harvesting. Uh, it keeps all the herbs within reach, and then you don't have to be stepping into the garden to, um, to be able to harvest. Because, you know, every time you step into the garden, it kind of makes compaction and, and not, that's not good for long term. So we really have, um, it's a really wonderful edge there, like I said, right up against the cafe. And um, really, uh, a really nice little spot too to kind of check out what's going on. So, So like I said earlier, um, we're really growing staples, um, you know, found in a good herb garden. For us, it's about uh, giving chefs as much flexibility. Um, so here we're having uh, basil and lavender, you know, rosemary, sage, oregano, thyme, so a couple different chives that we'll talk about, and, then, and some French tarragon as well. So here we're going to take a look at um, each of these and how to harvest. All right, basil. So basil is an annual herb, of course. Um, it's something that everybody is pretty familiar with. Um, it's something we replant uh, every year. Uh, the cafe likes to use it in fresh in their pasta sauce or, or as a garnish, so their gazpacho. So this is a sweet basil, really, that lends itself um, to Italian cooking. Uh, if you look up basil, you'll actually find that there are over 30 species and 200 um, different cultivars. So really, the types of basil is, is really uh, phenomenal. And then, um, one of the things that uh, I really like about that, each of those cultivars kind of have a different taste profile. So you have a, a Thai that might be a, have a little more licorice flavor. There's also um, a little spicy as well. Um, and then too, there's even ones that are like lemon or lime and kind of give that, that flavor uh, to your dishes as well. Um, so, then you don't want to miss out on this for your harvest. So what you want to do is you think about uh, harvesting the whole plant because it is an annual. And you can see that right here in this slide. So what you kind of do is take the top of the basil plant and, and you harvest it that way right through the season. Go back a second. Um, the other plant I have on here is lavender as well. So, you know, lavender really is a uh, perennial. Uh, it really does best in, you know, good drainage. And you will just have to uh, bear with me one second. I've just lost completely a train of thought. I apologize. So, um, it's really good in, in different kind of recipes. Yeah, you might not think of that, but we're going to talk about that in a, in a little bit. Lavender, you harvest this, the same way. You just want to take the tops 
off of the plant. Just pinch, you can see right here where I'm holding it in this photo. You just want to trim right there. And, uh, and that's how you harvest. So like I said, these have kind of similar uh, harvesting patterns. And um, really through the fall, that's kind of um, what you want to do. Um, if you see that there's going to be a hard frost, you might want to uh, harvest the entire uh, basil plant. You know, you can remove all the leaves because sometimes uh, through the season, that's what people want to do, just pull the leaves off. But really you want to be harvesting um, just the top, the top center, because what will happen is that you'll put off side branches coming off right um, off of each side. And that actually, that'll make your plant denser and uh, give you lots of more ends to harvest. And that's the same thing over here with the lavender as well. If you take it off right here, you really don't want to go way back into the plant because really that can cause a lot of damage. And you harvest there and you can, uh, you'll get some branching off of the tips and uh, that'll make your plant have a lot more for you to harvest next year. So again, replanting the basil, lavender um, really can be, um, a really good amount of time that you can have it. Really about five years, if you see that it starts to decline, you can really cut it back uh, hard and uh, you'll get a nice good flush of leaves out and uh, hopefully it'll do well. And if you do cut it back hard like that, just know, um, you know, if it doesn't rebound, well then you really needed to replace it anyway, so. So looking closer to then at the rosemary and the sage. Um, so the rosemary really is a tender perennial, which means that it uh, may come back or it may not. Our here, ours here rarely comes back. So, um, but I do know people who have had really good luck uh, with it as an annual. Um, this cultivar is a cultivar ARP, and it's really upright, and it's supposed to have some of the strongest fragrance, and then also be some of the most cold hardy. Uh, so uh, it's really a, a good cultivar for this area. And actually, all the information that I'm giving you today is for uh, the DC area. I know we could have people visiting from from all over the country. So um, really this information is DC based. So, so back to the, the rosemary, really is a, a really uh, can grow quite large, especially like I said, this cultivar really vigorous. What you want to do is keep, keep it pruned down. We kind of let this go um, this year, but um, that's fine. We have, we'll have lots to harvest uh, later on. Um, then looking at the sage as, um, as well. So this uh, is just garden sage. This is the one you think about a lot when you're thinking of uh, Thanksgiving stuffing. Uh, this is what you use there. But really, there's a really lot of different ways that sage can be used. Um, the cafe is actually going to be serving the blackberry sage um, agua fresca later on uh, this month, so, uh, or into October. Sorry, I'm already thinking that the month is over. So, um, yeah, so there are lots of different things that you can do with that. And I'm gonna go into more detail with some of that later on. For harvesting, same thing. Here you wanna be harvesting the tips. This is about eight inches long. And when you're harvesting, you really don't wanna go way back into the woody stems. Uh, again, if you're, you're cutting way back into the plant, uh, you may do some damage to it. Um, but really, we wanna just keep it nice and trim. I do cut it hard out of the walkway, but, but really it is um, just the tips that you wanna take. The same here uh, for the sage as well. Um, when you're doing rosemary, you may want to decide whether it's worth uh, keeping the plant in. If you know that you continually um, lose your rosemary, then you just want to pull the whole plant and harvest all the leaves off the stems. The sage really um, can last also for, for several years, so you can just go back and, and cut that back 
as, as well. All right, so here we have oregano and thyme. I find these to be long-lived perennials that come back year after year. And again, uh, there's lots of different kinds and they're so versatile, they can be used in nearly any kind of dish. Uh, through the season, these are best to harvest before they bloom, because once they bloom, really the leaves can get uh, a little bitter. So you really wanna uh, keep it fresh and keep them cut back. Um, one of the interesting things about um, oregano and thyme is that really if you cut them right before they bloom, um, really that's when they have the, the fullest flavor. Uh, then once they, they bloom, then that's the kind of the other side of the curve. So you really don't want that. You really want peak uh, fragrance um, and enjoyment out of them. So um, yeah, so you get them right when they're in bud but then not after they're flowering. The best thing to do after they flower is just to, to cut them back. You can kind of cut them back in half and then, then they'll put out a little, um, another flush. Um, this is talking more about the oregano for that kind of thing. Um, cutting back in half and then um, you can enjoy all the new, new ends that are gonna bloom out for you. The thyme, that you wanna be a little more delicate with. And actually for both of them, when you're harvesting, you really only wanna be taking off a third of the branches. So you can see there, really this is, uh, there's about two thirds of that branch back in there. So here you just wanna be taking off a third and, and that's what uh, you'll be harvesting. And one of the things we didn't talk about yet is the frequency of harvest. And so actually the oregano and thyme, um, you may get two or three harvests a year. So like I said, these are gonna bloom in the spring. Uh, so you're gonna cut them, well, it's kind of a, a later spring uh, bloom. So you'll cut them right before they bloom. And then it'll take a small period of time for them to recover. And so then once you, they recover, you can cut them again and you might get another one for the fall, but um, it'll be one way or the other. It'll either, you'll, you're, it'll recover and you'll have in time for the fall or you'll just miss it. But, um, but you still, you'll still get lots, lots of oregano and thyme uh, throughout the year and, and still some at this point too. And that's if you're wanting a, a really large harvest. If you really only want, you know, a couple stems here and there, you know, that's fine. You can go out and pick at any point and, and get what you need. I was talking more about, you know, a hard, uh, a hard cut for, for lots of uh, herbs to use for, for drying or for freezing, something that you want some large quantity for. Garlic chives and, and regular chives. So guess what the difference is? So um, the garlic chives actually have a lot of ch garlic flavor where the regular chives are, are more just the onions. You know, that's the one that you think about with baked potato and, and things like that. Um, so actually, even though they are very, um, they're very closely related, um, it's really, uh, they do have some differences. So the garlic chives actually put on a white flower in the late summer and, and the regular chives really um, bloom in the spring. So another thing about them too is that really it's an ongoing uh, cycle of them blooming and dropping seed. They really seed all over. So even though these are wonderful pollinators, you can see on the garlic chives, on the white flowers, they just get covered with pollinators and you still will wanna leave some. Um, if you're not harvesting the flowers um, because they are edible, um, the flowers really can be used for multiple things. Um, they can be used for garnish. They can, you can break them up and use them in salads. Um, really the flowers are, are fantastic. But if you do leave some for the pollinators, you may wanna cut the, the flowers off and not have them seed in because you do end up with chives everywhere or maybe you like that. But once you have enough and you don't wanna give any more to friends, uh, you may want to be deadheading them and, and getting uh, and keeping yourself uh, from having that kind of headache. So, 
harvesting chives, really there it's about the same, both on the garlic and the regular chives. So what really you wanna be doing is harvesting right there. You see where the two leaves um, divide? So right there, um, this is the little growing point right there. And if you harvest here, you can be harvesting uh, chives all, all season long. Also too, that I usually listen for when we're gonna have a hard freeze and then you come in and you can cut as much as you want um, without any problem because uh, the frost is just gonna make all those leaves melt and make them and not make them um, usable anymore. So um, a great, uh, great to just keep an eye out on what's going on with the weather and that can really dictate for uh, your last harvest. That's great, Jessica. We've got a couple of other questions about harvesting sure, other great. varieties. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Our, the first question is about cilantro and how to harvest it so that it keeps growing throughout the rest of the season. Absolutely. So for cilantro, um, I usually do take off just the leaves around the edges. Um, well, you don't wanna harvest a lot because uh, the idea is to keep it going so that you will have um, some, if you want it to reseed, we do a lot of that at my house, you let um, the cilantro reseed and then it comes back. So you don't wanna break off the growing point. Uh, you just wanna take off some of the side leaves, but you, you don't wanna take off more than a third. So you can keep kind of doing that um, all season long. Um, but that's another one that if you think that there's a frost gonna come, you know, I would take it all off because I would take it all, even the plant all out because that plant's not gonna come back. Um, what's gonna come back typically, at least at my house is, is the seeds. So um, yes, harvesting just like a third of the leaves off and then, um, and then you know, a, a total harvest at the end. Excellent. We also had a question about what herbs are best to bring indoors for the fall or winter to help keep them going? And if there's a particular type you would recommend for that indoor move? Yeah, so that's also a really, that's, a, that's very good too. So um, things that you can bring in certainly are, um, are some, I'll tell you, well, one thing I, I didn't discuss was that our, our garden out here is full sun. So sometimes it doesn't do the best to bring those, um, those in for the winter. Uh, I would recommend more things that, that are more, a little more shade tolerant. Um, you can bring in some like your lemon balm, you can grow uh, chives. Um, if you're gonna put stuff in the sunny window, you might even be able to keep um, a little, um, maybe a sage in there. But I would think um, small, small things like that parsley. Parsley is another one that you could keep on, you know, um, bring some in. It's actually, a, it's more of a biennial, so you could, you could have some there through the winter as well. Um, yeah, chives would make it too. I mean, you could, you could do a bunch of different things like that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I have loved seeing the questions come in and there are some that I am saving because I know that you're going to get into using and preserving harvests. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Yep. But please yep. folks continue to send in your good questions. So the last one that uh, we have a little out in the herb garden is the French tarragon. And um, maybe people aren't quite as familiar with this, but it uh, has a minty anise flavor. And one of the things we do now is that it's really happy in the garden. It really grows uh, tremendously. So the cutting garden volunteers and staff have to whack it nearly in half uh, in the middle of the season just because it becomes such a, uh, a mammoth. Uh, really, it's only supposed to get about uh, three and a half feet tall, and that's when it's really happy. And I swear ours uh, grows much more than that. Um, it's really good for French cuisine if you're um, if you're cooking um, any kind of uh, French foods. Um, it's also really good with chicken uh, and fish, and it also can be used in salads or as a garnish, like by, with like parsley is. So it really has a, a lot of 
a lot of interest for the culinary palate. Um, like I mentioned earlier, really grows really fast. It can be, mul it can be harvested multi multiple times a year. And then um, in the fall, I would just go through and try to keep it, give it a, a good haircut, um, especially if you've kind of hit it hard earlier in the year. But um, it doesn't really matter because really um, the first frost is going to burn this back uh, down to the ground as well. So again, you know, harvesting long sections here, you want to harvest, um, you know, where there, where there's a break where you have two little lateral leaves coming off and then that'll keep it going for the rest of the year. But like I said, in the fall, you just you know, can give it a really uh, a hard hack and, uh, and, and use it as much as, as you can. So, but I really find that the ends are really uh, the most flavorful and, and the most useful. So now using your herbs. So there's a million things you can do with it. So I'm gonna highlight a few. So um, really I'm gonna talk about freezing, infused oils, infused water, a little potpourri to make your house smell nice, simple syrup, and then of course how to dry. So freezing, really um, like it says there in the title, really a great method for storing a lot of fresh herbs. So I've, um, I like to freeze basil. So really, I'm going to kind of go through the process of that and uh, show you uh, what you can do at home, or maybe you uh, do some different freezing um, as well. And I'd love to hear that too. Um, but I'll show you kind of the method that I use. So first, I got my basil. And then I have you pull all the, the good leaves off. You really want to sort each individual leaf between the good and the bad. And then it's about washing and, and drying. So my family buys me all the different kinds of kitchen gadgets. So if you don't have a salad spinner, that's okay. You can dry it um, with a dish towel is fine. Um, anything that doesn't give off, uh, you know, doesn't give off lint or something like that because you don't want that in your food. But really washing and drying, you would think that, you know, you, it's kind of clean out there if it's above the ground like the basil is, but um, really you'll have dirt on it. You might have, you know, some little insects you didn't see. So it, it's really important in, in all these these processes um, to wash, wash and dry. And then, you know, drying is just, you know, especially for, for some of the other things we're going um, to use, um, ways we're going to use the herbs, you know, just so um, it doesn't water things down. Or then also if you do it in oils and stuff like that later on, you don't have a lot of uh, water in that. So then really before you do the chopping, you really need to think about what you want to use your herbs for. So I like to use mine, um, well, this is what I thought for this year coming up. I thought I would use it as a little appetizer, a little um, olive oil and basil and serve it. I, I am going to have, uh, whenever we have, uh, are able to, to get together again, I, I'm, I'm planning a little family thing. So I thought we'd do appetizer of, of bread and olive oil with basil. So that's the idea for that. Also, I'm interested in doing some drinks um, with basil as well. So I really want it chopped fine. So you can see that that's what I did. Uh, I actually used my herb scissors, which I have not done before. I just got them for uh, Christmas <laughs> my, from my mother. <laughs> so, um, so I used the herb uh, scissors to cut them up fine, and then I finished chopping with the knife, and so then I was ready to go. So filling the trays. This is, again, you have to decide what you want to do because, you know, if you wanted to have your leaves in bigger pieces, you could have done, we could, I could have done that as well. And, and you can certainly mess around um, like, with whatever you want. I felt that um, two tablespoons of chopped up basil with the olive oil was really a good quantity for me. Different recipes I, I, I've seen really call for two tablespoons just in case I want to do something else. You want to make this that it's usable, but then also um, 
full, you know, flexible as well to whatever you need, because I may change my mind, uh, you know, in, well, I could change my mind tomorrow, but, um, you know, in, th in three months, who knows what I'll want to do with this, but, so I'm filling up the trays. So you can see in this second part too, before I put the liquid in, so I have two here or four here, I mean, with two tablespoons of basil and then the olive oil. And then I have here, I only did one teaspoon of basil with water. And the reason for that is because I'm thinking to put that in drinks and I may only want to put that in like one serving. So if it's at one teaspoon, that's a better for one serving. And if I want more, um, you can, I can just do that. I can just add more. So, and, and I have, I have quite a few of these. So, um, and so once I put the quantities that I wanted in, I just went back and filled it up. Like I said, with olive oil, there's no specific, uh, you know, specific amount. I just made it. So, you know, it filled up the tray or, or, you know, the little, ice cube container area. I don't know what that's called, really one ice cube hole um, with oil, uh, just so I could carry it. You know, you want to make it movable so you, you can take it to the refrigerator and you don't want them also to all freeze together. So, so you just fill that up uh, normally. And then these are all, these are all with water. And then you can see here they are frozen. And, and really, I, I just, I leave it in for 24 hours. I'm not quite sure how fast they would freeze. Maybe in six hours you would have it frozen. I guess it depends on, on your, refriger your freezer as well. So, um, so I came back after 24 hours and then um, I, I put them out here. So I, I, I got them all out so you could see what they look like. I do not recommend doing that. I would recommend having your plastic bags ready and labeled and just take them directly from uh, the tray into the bag because they will start to melt really fast and then you, uh, you might have a mess on your hands. But uh, just really quick and, and get them into the freezer. Again, really important to label your stuff and I'll tell you why uh, in a little bit as well. But. So this is such a, a good way to keep uh, your herbs fresh. And you wanna think about things that don't necessarily taste so good when they're dry. Um, things like cilantro, um, you know, chives, mint even, you can drop that, uh, you know, an ice cube right into uh, one of your drinks. Um, dill too is something that I like, uh, you know, fresh. So, but, and, and then too, you, the base could be anything. As you see here, you know, you could do cilantro in a tomato sauce for salsa. There, there are so many different things you can do. This is also a great way to freeze pesto as well um, if you just want small quantities. Like if you just want to be putting it on top of a sandwich or, or something like that, you can do lots of different things that way. Um, dill and butter so you can use like tomato sauce you can use butter you can use broth you can use anything really um as the liquid and you just have your your herbs in that and uh, then it's ready to to go whenever you want that during the winter you can just drop it in and um and and there it is for you another thing is a uh, way to use it is infused oil so you can buy some at the store and it's usually a little expensive, but really um, nothing beats making your own. So what I did, I did the Spruce Eats uh, recipe and it's just olive oil. It's a cup of olive oil and it's a cup, a quarter cup of rosemary leaves. And you just prep your ingredients and that when I say about that, you know, you're washing and you're drying. And then, you know, when I didn't chop these, well, all I, all I did was I pressed it with the back of the, the knife there and kind of just bruised it so you can get those oils flowing. So then that all went in a, in a little um, saucepan. And the big thing about this is to just um, start off with really, really low heat. 
So you're actually going to heat the oil up, but you don't want to end up frying um, the leaves. So it's really for a short period of time. I had it on less than five minutes, but I stood right over it. And every time I saw that it was starting to simmer a little bit, I would, I would whisk it and, uh, and keep it moving. So it was getting hot, but really it wasn't cooking or frying the leaves. So that's a really important aspect because um, I did not want to end up just to have like a burnt, <laughs> a burnt mess in there. Um, but I got it heated and so then you just let it sit for an hour. Um, you can let it sit longer. You know, it's recommended that you let it just sit for one whole hour. Um, I think I, you can, I think for me personally, I couldn't get back to it. So it sat like six hours and it's all fine. Um, then what I did was strain. You can see me straining it there. And then, yeah, you just bottle it up and close it up and seal it. And this is where my story about labeling things come in, because I make a lot of crazy things in my house. And so my son was looking on for a simple syrup, which I'm going to tell you how to make in a minute. <laughs> and instead, he found um, infused oil that wasn't labeled and thought that must be simple syrup. So he ended up with olive oil in his coffee, and he was not real pleased. <laughs> So labeling is a really, really good thing. So, all right. So infused oil, really good. Um, uh, how I was going to use this too is you can use this on, on a baguette. You can use it over potatoes or root vegetables, just drizzled on chicken. I saw somebody said it's really good on popcorn, but I have not tried the popcorn root um, with, the, with this yet. But um, yeah, I, I, I can believe it. Other herbs you could try basil, oregano, thyme, tarragon, uh, dill. Really, there, there's, uh, the flavors are, are endless. So um, lots of really neat ways to do this, and, and they're all really very delicious. Jessica, I've got yeah. a question about how long the infused oil will stay good and fresh and flavorful. Perfect. So in your refrigerator, six months. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. It really, it really can last. A, it really can last a long time. So, yeah. Um, I think I said out on the counter. Then it's a, it's a much shorter lifespan. I think it's a month or so. But I usually keep mine uh, in the refrigerator. You do when you want to use it. You do need to bring it up to room temperature and stir it up because it, you will get some separating and things like that. So, um, yes, very good question. Excellent. Thank you. Infused water. So this is a fun thing to do at home. Um, they, they sell to now all different kinds of um, infusing equipment, I would like to say. You can buy, uh, you know, little screens that go into your pitcher or into your water ball, bottle that has uh, different kind of vegetables or or um, herbs in it. Uh, I'm just, I just did it straight into into the pitcher, as you can see. So this is a recipe, I kind of tweaked it a little bit by, by Culinary Hill. There's some really great food bloggers on that, that have really creative and, and um, ideas that really actually work. So this is, this is a good one. One cup of blueberries. So a lot of places they tell you to put the blueberries in whole. I, that never works for me. I always need to have, have the blueberries to get that flavor out. Uh, also, four slices of uh, lemon as well. I don't use more than four. I, I've tried it with more lemon and it really ends up to be um, uh, so, um, you know, acidic that then you might have to think about sugar and the idea is not to um, add sugar to these uh, infused waters. That is just something, you know, uh, fresh, a change um, just from, you know, regular water. Four sprigs of rosemary and here, same thing, washed. Um, you know, you can decide about drying or not because you're just adding it to more water. But um, yeah, definitely washed. And here you want to leave them um, in large pieces as well. You can um, break the back, you would say, uh, of the leaves with the knife, kind of like I did in the infused oils. 
and then it's all about just letting it uh, sit in water. So this is again something you can leave overnight and then have it really um, nice the, the next day. And here you can see that that's exactly uh, what, we, what we did. We we're serving it. I put a little ice in it. I took a little bit of, of the fruit out. But really, I tell you, the blueberries lose a lot of flavor because you really want it to be infused into, um, into the water. You don't want the fruit to be tasting great or then you haven't infused into the water. So you may even want to keep a little handful of uh, full blueberries uh, to throw in if you're going to serve it to guests. Other ideas, there's strawberry, basil, and lemon, honeydew, uh, with cucumber and mint. Uh, mint obviously is a great one um, to, to use. And if you freeze some, you can actually uh, do this in the winter if you don't have access um, or if you don't want to go spend the money uh, in the grocery store. So, Stove top potpourri. We're going to get away from the culinary for a half a minute and talk about making your house smell nice. So and this is a lemon and rosemary um, recipe. Rachel Schultz is also a blogger who does a, um, a lot of different things and um, she has these recipes for stove top potpourri. So really it's about slicing up two lemons, putting in a teaspoon of vanilla and a few sprigs of rosemary. And so that all goes into a pot. I think this is a three quart saucepan. And so then you just want to slowly simmer that. And um, yeah, really gives a, a wonderful fragrance to your home. Um, really good if you're doing some, you know, some cleaning around the house. The lemon makes it uh, really a sparkle, kind of, if that makes any sense for a smell. Um, but then, too, uh, the vanilla gives it a nice, a rich aroma as well. Um, and, it, and it works well. And that actually, if you keep it on the stove, you can simmer it um, off and on for nearly over three days and um, it'll be good. I mean, it's good if uh, you're, you know, you're having guests and you wanna you know, um, have a nice little aroma going uh, in the house. There's a lot of different recipes for these as well. Um, one that's more for the holiday season is this cranberry uh, cinnamon one that, that she recommends as well. So you really can have kind of a, a lot of fun with that. Uh, the simple syrup. Here we go. Um, so this is what my son really wanted. <laughs> Um, the ing ingredients really, again, you want to prep them, uh, you know, it's washing. This time where they were doing it um, with lavender, Ma many of the other things we were making you saw was with rosemary. But really, um, lavender, you really think of using just the flowers, but um, really the leaves at this time of year, um, you know, why not? Um, they just have a, a wonderful fragrance and they're edible and all of that as well. So. Um, yeah, just because you don't have lavender flowers doesn't mean you can't do something with lavender. So here again, two, two tablespoons of lavender leaves, one cup of sugar, one cup of water. So this again all goes into the pot and you wanna simmer it. Again, you don't wanna get it so hot um, and, and, and boiling so hard that you start to, um, you know, burn the sugar or you end up getting it too, you know, caramelized. You do want it to thicken a little bit, but really just kind of a, a, a soft simmer. And um, I did, I simmered this for about 30 minutes, um, which is kind of what I, I normally do. Uh, it gets it a little thick, but still, still usable in a drink. And uh, here again, you see that then I strained it out. And here it is again stored. So um, really, this is a great, I think, a very round, well-rounded flavor. If you feel, you know, you want a little more lavender, you can go up to four tablespoons and that's fine too, you know. It's whatever you, you like and whatever the flavor um, you want. But I thought, uh, well, I think that uh, two tablespoons is, is good to, and, and and it's just really um, pretty well-rounded. But if you want it a heavier lavender taste, 
by all means add more. I think if you add any less, you won't, you won't get that flavor you're looking for. So then a simple syrup can use, be used for a hundred different things, you know, cocktails, making bee's knees with it, uh, tea or lemonade. Um, you know, you can also, when you're, if you're baking your own cake, you can brush it on uh, the different uh, layers to get that lavender or whatever flavor you want in it. Uh, also, you can just use it kind of as a syrup over waffles. And, and this is really uh, useful for a lot of different things, lemon verbena, mint, basil, rosemary, anything like that. Jessica, we got a question early on about whether you had any suggestions for pineapple sage. And I think this sounds like this might be one of the good ones for pineapple that, sage. Absolutely, I, I, I totally agree. I think simple syrup would, would be the way to go to go for that, so yeah. I did also see that there's a recipe for a pineapple sage mojito, if that's something that is up your alley. Very excellent. So then drying, um, yeah, this, I mean, a great way to store your uh, herbs really long-term. So you can do it by hanging, you can also just put them out on a tray. For some reason, my, in my house, my dining room table is that the dining room table, the dining room and the living room are really very dry in my house. So it's always good to know where the dry spots are, and then you can just set out some trays uh, if you're not having guests, especially at this time, and have them. Uh, you know, they just dry so quick. I can have a, you know, I can have a tray of rosemary or whatever really dry in a week and a half or something, or sometimes under a week. So um, it's really very good. Hanging is a little more long term. Um, you want to try to find a place that's pretty dark, but then also dry as well. You can hang them up and they can be hung there for, you know, for months or however long uh, you need to get them dry. Um, but we do this, uh, you know, I do this a lot in my house, but I kind of do the tray version. Uh, it just works well for me and, and how much do I dry. Or you can go the dehydrator route. My son is a big uh, Binging with Babish fan, if you know YouTubers that are big chefs. So that's who he follows. And this is a $350 um, dehydrator. It is the Sahara from, um, oh, now where is that? From, oh, Broad and Taylor. That is the company that makes it. So I do not own that. My dehydrator is pretty sad, so that's why I typically go with, um, you know, the, uh, the drying by itself method. Um, but so I just want to go back and just say one thing too, you know, really good too about, you know, draw, you know, washing it again and then kind of keeping it, you know, keeping it in a clean place. So, so think about that as well. Uh, preparing for storage. So once I do have my dried rosemary, you pull the leaves all off uh, and then I put it in, this is actually a little blender cup that makes smoothies, but I find it really good for grinding my herbs. So I just put it all in there and here is the product when it's ground up. And then again, you know, I use uh, the canning jars for everything. So again, you know, in a sealed, um, sealed canning jar, I mean, not sealed like you would can it, but, you know, just screwed on the top so moisture doesn't get in. And um, yeah, it lasts for, for a really, really long time. Um, one thing I just want to make say to you that when you're checking to see if it's dry enough, you really want the leaves, especially the rosemary, to snap. If you're not getting that snap, it's not dry enough, and it won't, uh, you know, it won't be good. You're not ready to process it and try to keep it that way. So the leaves really need to be really dry and really snap, and then you know that it's dry enough. So, Jessica, we got a question about um, what best uses for dried herbs are if it's just cooking or if there's anything else that you found that to be a good use? Yeah, 
So uh, more potpourri, <laughs> you know, uh, you can make little satchels. They do that a lot with lavender. Uh, you can do a lavender in, in, uh, with some rice. And then if you're concerned that it's uh, uh, long-term storage, they'll eat, the rice will even suck in moisture if you put it in a drawer or something like that. You can make those kind of little satchels. They're actually coming a little bit back into fashion. Uh, you can find some different uh, uh, patterns and things like that for them. Um, so other dried, well, you can also, if you want to go the spiritual route, you can do sage and, and you can um, go around blessing your house with the dried sage. Uh, that's also a use for, for the dried herbs. There's lots of different things. So those are crazy things that come to my brain right now. Janet asked if you've ever tried drying your own chives and whether they would be chopped before or after they dry. Any other tips? Yeah, so you can dry chives. I may say that um, in my experience, well, they, they keep some of their flavor, but you might find um, they keep more of the flavor if you went the frozen roots. Um, I've even heard that people can freeze uh, chives, actually the stems themselves. So what you would do is you would harvest your chives and then lay them in a single um, a single layer on a, a cookie sheet and put it in your freezer that way and you could keep them that way and then you know you would just uh, you know cut it up with a pair of scissors or something uh, when you want to use it. Um, but I mean drying, drying is fine. Um, I would say I have not done personally drying of chives and I'm trying to think, I would think that um, though it, it would certainly work if you did it on like the tray method or if you wanted to hang them up. Yeah, I don't see why not. So yeah, give it a try. I think I would wait though. Um, no, no, no. I think you could do it either way. I was gonna say, do I wanna keep it dried um, all together? But really you could chop it up. People sometimes do the chopped herbs and then put it kind of um, in a little warmer, sunnier area. You don't want sun to directly hit it, but um, I really think either way, but there's a lot of different ways um, you can uh, keep chives through the winter. And we also just got a question from Jenny. I'm sorry, I must have misread her initial question about um, about what to use dried herbs for, because she said, but you wouldn't use them for cooking? Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. I thought you were looking for other uses for <laughs> dried herbs. Oh, yes. Cooking is definitely a great use for dried herbs. Yes, dried herbs for cooking, of course. Yes. Um, yep. Uh, even to you can instead, what I do, sorry, let me start over. So here where you're looking where I have this in um, just a canning jar, I just usually use that to fill up my real uh, shaker. Uh, you know, you get that, that will actually be nice looking. <laughs> um, so you can use that for cooking all the time. You can just keep refilling if you have, have certain containers that you like to use while you're cooking, or you can just you know, scoop spoonfuls out of that and put it in your, in your soup or, or anything like that. Yep, absolutely. Jessica, we've also gotten a couple of questions about keeping herbs like basil or cilantro or other herbs fresh in the refrigerator. And I'm guessing that it would be like a short, mm -hmm. a sh relatively short time that you'd oh. recommend trying to keep them fresh in the fridge before preserving them another way. Um, but in particular, trying to make sure that they don't get too damp or soggy. That is the trick, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So what I have done before, and um, so I have put in a, you know, like a gallon plastic bag, you can put the herbs in there, but then with, um, uh, paper towels on both sides so you because you really do have to have that balancing act that they don't dry up but then also that uh, they don't you know just just rot right away too so it really is a balancing act but I think in a plastic bag with um, paper towels and you may have to go in um, depending on how how long you want to keep them you know change out the 
the paper towels when you feel that they're getting damp because if they don't suck in the you know the moisture then the then you'll go you'll go the other way and, and have them rot so uh yeah yeah, that's a challenge. Yes, always. I have sometimes kept fresh parsley in a you know cup full of water. Oh, sitting outside. Yeah, I sometimes put it in the fridge, and I need to make sure that it doesn't get shoved too far back in mine, or they start to freeze. Um, that is, yeah. I've had success with that for two or three days, maybe before they start to get too soggy. Yep, yep. Or you can even do it just like a cut flower as well, and you can put it in uh, in some water sitting out, sitting out as well. That's another way to keep them um, keep them too. So, mm -hmm. excellent. And in the chat, someone just added a house dressing recipe for olive oil, balsamic vinegar, dried tarragon, and fresh ground black pepper, which is thank you so much. Delightful, That's fantastic. Yes, all those. We used to have a chef at the cafe who who would make his own blends from um, the herbs. He would dry them from here from Hillwood and, and make his own blends um, for for the Hillwood Cafe. Uh, they've gone to using them more fresh right now, but he he was quite something. So, yeah. Let's yeah. see, um, Ruth just asked if we can store fresh basil in olive oil in a mason jar all winter and then pull out the leaves as a way of preserving, which sounds somewhat similar to your frozen olive oil cubes. Yeah, you know what? That's a very interesting question, but I, I would think so. Um, I too, I guess I would think about maybe keeping that in the refrigerator as well. Just because, you know, well, I don't know. Yeah, I would say, you know, give it a try. <laughs> I haven't done that personally, but you can certainly see how that goes, but it's very... And, and please report back to us yeah, next yeah, spring. Yeah, that, for sure. We got a couple of questions about whether simple syrup and infused oils need to be refrigerated. I know I've always refrigerated my simple syrups, um, but yeah. do you have to? Um, I don't know if you have to, but I've just heard that really lengthens the shelf life of it. So, uh, I mean, if you're going to use it up in a, in a few days, or I, I would think it would be fine. Um, I've just always heard that really just extends the shelf life. So, Excellent. And you mentioned the same thing earlier with infused oils, that that can help them last almost six months or so in yeah. the fridge. Yeah. yeah. Um, but those can, yeah, those can sit out for a little while. Yeah. Well, I am looking at the clock and see that time has flown no, and some of our questions have dwindled. So um, I, will, I will yammer for a few minutes in case there is a pressing question someone has been dying to type in right now. But this has been a really delightful afternoon. I'm so glad that I got to spend it with all of our visitors. And yes, someone did say you definitely need to refrigerate the simple syrup once they're infused. <laughs> um, yeah, I but yeah. it's it's been a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for spending it with us at Hillwood. We hope we'll see you around the gardens soon. And you'll be getting an email from me a little bit later with a link to a survey. We do um, would love to hear your feedback and comments. These are, we're still getting the hang of these Zoom workshop type programs. And Ruth also sent a note asking if the presentation will be available. I will absolutely save this as a PDF and include it in that message with the survey link. Thank you for a wonderful weekend. I hope everybody goes out and puts these tips to good use right away for a fragrant weekend. All right. Thank you. Thank you.